Hello, good afternoon everybody and welcome to the White House. We're so excited to have you here today to celebrate our really outstanding Champions of Change for Climate Education and Literacy. It's gonna be a really wonderful program. They will be on panels and taking questions from the audience. We know you guys are not a shy group, so just speak up and ask them questions. Um, they're here to chat with us today and share some of their wisdom and experience. We also encourage you to follow along on social media um, using the hashtag White House Champs and the hashtag Act on Climate, as well as Facebook, Instagram, or any other sources of social media that you want to use. Um, and uh, with that, it, uh, and also um, we can tune in, folks at home are tuning in live on whitehouse.gov slash live. So if you have friends and family out in the world who can't be in the room with us today, they can watch us online. So it now gives me great pleasure to introduce to you um, Dr. John Holdren, who is the director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, as well as the assistant to the president for science and technology. Dr. Holdren. Well, thank you very much, Laura, and let me add uh, my welcome to the White House and extend a welcome as well on behalf of President Obama, who is delighted that you could all be here. Uh, it's really terrific to see so many great uh, and enthusiastic students and educators and practitioners who are working every day to lift our game in climate education and literacy, which is, of course, what this is all about. Uh, I'm particularly excited to be able to recognize our outstanding champions of change in this domain. I'd like to ask the champions to stand up so we can give them a big hand. These, uh, these eight individuals, these champions of change, were selected from over 100 nominations that we got from all across the country. They're truly outstanding. Their work in classrooms and communities in enhancing science-based understanding of climate change impacts and solutions has really been extraordinary. And you will have the opportunity to hear more from them, of course, in a few minutes. President Obama has said time and time again that lifting our game in STEM education is one of the single most important things we can do for the future of our country, ensuring that Americans have the skills, the tools, and the knowledge that will be needed to build a bright and prosperous tomorrow. A related top priority of the president, of course, is addressing global climate change, addressing it through cutting domestic carbon pollution, preparing for the impact of climate change that we can no longer avoid, and leading international efforts to address climate change. The president has argued, and I certainly agree, that climate change is one of the defining challenges of our time. And to meet that challenge, it is essential that our citizens and our students have access to the best available science and to the related information and tools that we need to develop and implement solutions. We're going to be depending on America's science literate citizens to make the next breakthroughs in energy technology, to design better buildings and transportation systems, and to work with decision makers, including farmers, water resource managers, city, state, and tribal officials, and more, to enhance the resilience of our society to changes in climate that are already occurring and that will continue for some time despite uh, our best efforts at climate change mitigation, at reducing worldwide the responsible emissions. So recognizing that need, in December, my office launched with the help of others in the executive office of the president, the Climate Education and Literacy Initiative, and we announced a series of new commitments from organizations inside and outside the government to advance climate change education. The goal is to ensure that every student and every citizen in this country is climate change literate. That's a bold goal. Obviously, we have a ways to go. Success is going to require all of us working together as a community, and that, of course, is why you're all here today. The science has never been clearer. I say that as the president's science advisor. We have better understanding now than ever before of what is happening, why it's happening, what consequences it's having, and what we can do about it. And we continue to learn more every single day. The National Climate Assessment, the third U.S. National Assessment of Climate Impacts on the United States, released last May, makes even more clear than before 
that climate change is not a distant threat. It is something that's happening now. It has moved firmly into the present. In my role, I see broad and growing public awareness of that issue and of support for action to meet the climate change challenge. And we have a president and an administration that truly gets it about the need for action on climate change. And that is why a whole series of major efforts to get the job done are already in motion, including this one. There's a lot more to do, and doing more to educate our students and citizens is, of course, a critical part of the puzzle. What I'm finding is that students are increasingly interested in pursuing careers around addressing environmental challenges, in part because they know they're already living in a world that's being affected by those challenges across the board and by climate change in particular. Schools have been stepping up to meet that growing demand by integrating best available climate information into their classes, offering relevant courses and programs, and providing professional development and training for students and for educators. It's important to note as well that a lot of learning about this issue occurs outside classrooms in our national and state parks, in museums, in zoos, aquariums, and a lot of other venues. Informal and place-based education can be great mechanisms for connecting students of all ages to information about climate change. With that, I'm going to thank you again for being here, and I'm going to ask Faye Jenks to come up and preside over the introduction of the individual champions of change. Faye? All right. So first, our first champion is Gina Fiorelli, an environmental studies student at the University of Vermont. Next, we have Linda Gansitano, a physical education teacher at Driftwood Middle School in Hollywood, Florida. Craig Johnson, a high school educator at the School of Environmental Studies in Apple Valley, Minnesota. Next, we have David Lustick, the Associate Professor of Science Education at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Next, we have John Morris, an Interpretive Program Manager at the National Park Service, recently retired, uh, in Eagle River, Alaska. Next, uh, the Georgia Program Manager at the Alliance for Climate Education, Amber Nave. Next, we have Sarah Mae Nelson, a conservation interpreter at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And last but certainly not least, Amy Snover, Assistant Dean for Applied Research at the University of Washington. So Dr. Holdren, we'll have you step in the middle for a group picture. And everyone, let's give our champs a round of applause. And families can take all of their pictures <laughs> before we break for the first panel. All right, one last round of applause. Thank you, everybody. And our first panel will just ask to stay. Thank you, Dr. Holdren. And now it is my great, great pleasure to introduce uh, our first panel and our moderator for our first panel, Dr. Marshall Shepard, who is a former president of the American Meteorological S Society, the Georgia Athletic Association Distinguished Professor of Geography and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Georgia, 
and host of the Weather Channel's Sunday morning show, Weather Geeks. That's WX Geeks for all of you who want to tune in. Uh, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Shepard. I brought my phone up here because I'm an avid tweeter, so I'm not being rude. I'm going to actually be <laughs> tweeting some of what's going on out here. It's really, it really is an honor to be here with these uh, inspiring colleagues. Uh, if you're out there in the trenches on climate and climate science, you know it can be disheartening at times because there's a lot of misinformation and, and things out there. But when you see uh, people like this, it's quite inspiring because they are doing things to advance climate literacy and climate education in this country. So I wanted to take this time to introduce our panel. We'll start off with Linda. Linda, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, why you're here, just a brief summary of who you are and why you're here, and we'll do that for everyone, and then we'll get right into the questions. Well, um, let's see. I, uh, I'm a physical education teacher, but my love is for the environment and animals and all life. And we started a green team in 2008, and we started with three teachers, three students. And we were able to start a energy conservation program, which is called the How Low Can We Go Challenge. We started at 450,000 kilowatts a month. And we were able, within four years, drop to, to as low as 219,000 with a 23% decrease in energy usage. And we'll, we'll hear more about that as we go along. So thank you there. And we'll go to Craig next. Craig. Yeah, my name is Craig Johnson. I teach senior environmental studies at the School of Environmental Studies in Apple Valley, Minnesota. Um, I've been following this issue for a long time um, and maybe 20 years ago had this growing awareness through some speakers and things that I heard of uh, what the issue really meant to my state in Minnesota. Uh, the school that I teach at, uh, we have the opportunity to get kids involved. Uh, we have field studies that have been all over the world related to this. Uh, uh, field study on Baffin Island with Inuit cultures and uh, most recently uh, attending the uh, UNFCCC uh, climate change conferences around the world. Yeah, thank you. And then we'll go next to Gina. This really is a generation that I think is going to tackle this issue most fervently. So Gina, tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, and I'm happy to be representing that generation. Um, I'm an environmental studies student at the University of Vermont. Um, I grew up in the Adirondack Park in upstate New York, um, where I had a lot of opportunities to get involved in the climate change uh, cause. And I um, was a student leader at my high school, and now I'm able to study it um, in college. And last but not least, Amber from my home state, <laughs> Georgia. Hello, everyone. <laughs> my name is Amber Nave, and I represent the Alliance for Climate Education. I started working with the Alliance for Climate Education in 2011. And at ACE, which we call it, we just believe that teenagers have the most to lose when it comes to climate change, but the most to gain when, or the most to gain by fighting it, excuse me. So we work with students to educate them on climate science and then help them do projects, climate action projects. Uh, and, and again, you, you see why they're here and we're gonna dive into that more. And, and please have your questions ready as well because we wanna hear from you as well. Uh, I often say that you know we live on one planet, planet Earth, and we only have that one planet. So climate, climate literacy, and climate change should be the most no-brainer bipartisan issue ever because we only have one planet, and I think this is really being represented by these folks today. I want to start, Craig, how do we engage the public and students and educators more in climate? I mean, what, I mean, what's some technique or something that you recommend from your, your lens? Well, I think uh, for me, one, one piece is that um, people have to realize that it's, it's a multifaceted issue, and, and uh, certainly you have to understand the science, but we also have to understand that there are a lot of other components to it, uh, with students, I think it's really important that uh, we can look at it in an intellectual way, we can look at it in a big picture way, but in the end, uh, there are things that they can learn about their own home, their own place, their own environment, and things that they can do in their own place, their own home, and their own environment that is empowering and that helps them feel like uh, that there is a future for them and in, in the, in, in a, a place for them in this issue. And Gina, from your purview as a college student, uh, are, are there things that you, ways that you and your peers look at this differently or are we all in the same boat in terms of how we approach it from engaging your peers? Well, um, I think that I'm, I'm lucky to be surrounded by students that are definitely um, educated about the issue. Um, and we live together in a community. Um, I'm lucky to live in a dorm with other like-minded people um, that really try hard to reduce energy and reduce their water use, um, things like that. 
And I think that that message is being spread further and further as time goes on. Um, it's definitely becoming a more commonly known um, issue and how to solve it is becoming more well known too, which is really, really exciting. And, and Amber, tell us a bit more about the people that your constituents, who you face and what are some of the challenges or opportunities you see in engaging those constituents? Certainly. Um, I work, at ACE, we work with primarily high school students, that age group of 14 to 18 years old, 9th to 12th grade. And some of the challenges we face are that students just aren't educated about the science. And, and we at ACE focus on engaging students in the undeniable science behind climate change and then finding out where their interests lie. I have a lot of students that I work with specifically in Georgia who are interested in the performing arts, interested in music, interested in media. And so we help them to engage in solutions of climate change through that lens, through that lens of performing arts or media or music. And Linda, I know you're in the state of Florida, I, yes. and, and I, I went to school in Florida, Florida State, and one of the states that's most vulnerable to climate change is sea level rise, uh, perhaps more intense hurricanes, which is something that the peer review literature suggests. How do you reach students and engage your students and your peers and educators, and do you use any of those types of facts in your presentation? Yes, we do. We, meet to, we try to get the kids to find climate change or initiatives that we can use to reduce kilowatt usage, and we make it attractive. So we have a program called Are You Sexy, oh, right? That'll get, it, that'll get their attention. <laughs> it's it's S-E-K-C, Are You Stopping Excessive Kilowatt Consumption? Okay. And we've got a hero program. <laughs> yeah. And we have, we have it posted all over school, and the kids are trying to figure out what it means, you know, and we're going to have shirts made. and. The kids really like stuff like that, so we're trying to find yeah. it attractive. Oh, yeah, and and yeah. I, I think you're hitting on something key, yeah. and one of the things I often talk about as a scientist that speaks in a variety of venues, you know, we, people's eyes glaze over when you talk about charts and trends and PDF file and all that type of thing. We have to make this uh, accessible, yeah. and so I, I mean, tell us a little bit more about that. Um, accessible, but also... Um, oh. We give them a reason, the value, you know, and I have a green team of about 43 kids and they come after school on their own time. And uh, we break it off, we have different pieces to the environment that might be attractive to them. I have an energy team, I have a recycle team, and we have a vegetable and gardening and the animal piece of our green team. And they get to choose and they get to go to any one of the pieces that they like and they're inspired by the most. Right. And uh, you know, they do the energy audits and then they go out and they garden and they take care of nature. We have released animals, we have burring owls, we have squirrels, we have it all on our campus. Yeah. And we just open it, we're constantly inviting kids to come whenever they want. Right. You know, it's an open door, if they don't wanna come one day, that's okay, and if they wanna come, the other kids are bringing their friends. Right. You know, and they're turning into a friend thing. You have two or three best friends, they're all walking around campus recycling. It's like the cool thing to do. Yeah, <laughs> and Craig, I'm, and, I, and feel free any of you to answer this question, but. Mm -hmm. How do you gauge whether you're successful in what you're doing? Well, I think uh, you know, part of it is to get the, the at least in, in my students, I work primarily with seniors, is to get them, uh, when you see them asking questions, when you see them wondering, when you see them wrestling with not just you know, the, the, the facts, but with the uncertainty of it in terms of how do we understand science, and yet, um, willing to ask questions, willing to go to the next thing, wondering about um, some piece. I have a student with me to here today that uh, is, is really- Raise your hand if you I want to see where you are. There you are. That's Hannah. <laughs> uh, that you know, has really locked in on this idea of intergenerational equity. Well, who's making the decisions about these things and who is going to be here to deal with those things? And when you see students locking in on, on those big ideas, um, you know that, that you have students that are not going to just uh, follow this in the class that you teach them or in, in the setting that you have them, but they're going to they're going to keep this is part of their this is part of the fabric of their life now. They're going to be asking these questions. Yeah, and, I, and again, I want to uh, please. Sure, um, at ACE we gauge our success 
primarily on modules that focus on training students about a specific topic or idea around climate change and then allowing them to absorb enough information that they can then go train their peers. So for example, in Atlanta, we had a, a letter writing campaign where we, we brought citizens climate lobby in and we had them trained on how to write their representative, how to correspond with government officials about issues that matter to them. And then later on in the year, we have them facilitating that tr same training to their peers. So that's one way at ACE we gauge how successful we are. And I want to take this time, if you have some questions that you, I think we do have some microphones that are going to be available in the audience too. So please just by show of hand, if you have some questions, you want to get in on the conversation here. Uh, wh while we're getting to that young uh, person up, uh, out there, uh, you know, you're a Gina, a, a part of what I call the social media age. And there is a lot of noise versus signal out there on Twitter and other places. But you're the generation for that. Uh, when the things that you're doing, how do you filter that, that noise and get to the signal from your perspective? Um, well, I would, my experience with social media, I used to run the Facebook page for my environmental club at high school. And I mean, that was a small thing, but also it reached a lot of people. And that's cool. That's what's really cool about social media is that you can tell a lot of people one thing at once. And um, I think it's a really useful tool. Um, we're finding that out more and more. And I'd like to just say like ACE, I saw them when I was in high school. I went to two presentations of theirs. It was really, really awesome. Um, there were students, I obviously already had an interest in the environment, but it was, um, the presentation was to the whole population of the school. So there were students that never really thought about the issue that were exposed to it. And one of the things that the presenter was saying to us was that um, social media and um, getting the word out is one of the most important things you can do with this issue. Um, and it's, it's really inspiring to see what that has done already. Thank you. So we did have a question out there. Take that. Yeah. We'll start with Eugenia. Um, I would definitely say um, I'm I'm at the University of Vermont, so there are definitely a lot of students that are <laughs> interested in the environment, uh, which is pretty cool. But I would definitely say, as a whole, um, college students are very interested in getting involved. Um, high school, it's easy because you are um, doing things on a smaller scale. There are generally less students there. So that's a really cool um, advantage that you have working in high schools. But in colleges, um, another advantage is that you can work um, with students that have more, more of an interest in the issue. So um, they'll generally be more motivated. And that's, that's a really cool thing to be happening in college. So yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? No. Any other questions? From the audience? While we're looking around, then please, uh, you know, let us know if you want to ask a question. But while we're looking around, I mean, say uh, Dr. Holdren, who was just here, tasked us to come up with four techniques that you would recommend when someone comes up to you at the mall or in Walmart or Target, we want to be fair, or wherever, um, and says, what do I do? What can I do as an educator, as a student? What is something that you recommend that you feel is a, just a, 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 an effective technique? Uh, we'll start with you, Linda. Effective technique? The effective technique for climate literacy, climate education that you found with your students that maybe has applicability beyond your students. Just the sort of notion of the relevance to their lives and some of the well, things. Well, just like I said, um, giving the kids the energy audits and they walk from classroom to classroom and they look at the things that are actually on the energy audits and they're assessing all the teachers' classrooms and just them becoming aware of it. Now they're more inclined to go home and do the same thing at home. Right. You know, being able to read the meter. Right. You know, that's something every one of my green team members can do. They can go and they know exactly what's going on, what day is more, uh, that they're utilizing more energy, uh, what can we do to maybe seal off the rooms, close the doors, close the blinds. Mm -hmm. You know, these kids are unplug the, um, the power strips. These are things that I don't think as co coming in from elementary, they were as aware as what they're getting now in middle school. Great point. So. Craig, you have any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I'm not sure about Target or Walmart, but I, I, I do think that um, uh, for my, the students that I work with, um, giving them opportunities um, to engage things that are important to them. And, and, and within the school environment, to, as, as Linda was saying, to, to have an opportunity to act on things that, that they think are important, or that, that to give them a voice and give them some autonomy, whether that's uh, um, a carbon diet challenge for the school, perhaps, or whether that's uh, 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 sequest or excuse me, uh, mitigation strategies with tree planting or, or that sort of thing, or whether that's uh, 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 a carpooling initiative, or whether that's uh, student exchanges with people in other part of the world, other parts of the world, where they realize, well, this isn't just here. Um, I think projects that let students. Uh, at least at the high school level, uh, to, to engage the real world. This is, this is not a drill. Here we go. <laughs> I like that. Uh, yes. And um, uh, for them to do that in real and authentic ways is important. Hashtag this is not a drill. I think that has a <laughs> ring to it. I think that does have a ring. Yes. We have a question. We'll come back. Well, let's take this question, and then we'll perhaps continue on down the line after that. Yes. Thoughts on that? Misconception. Yeah, misconceptions coming in. I, and I know at the university level where I am, I see it, so I know it's out there. Um, it looks like you have something you want to say about that, Ann? Sure. I can uh, speak from two different levels. At ACE, we do have an education program and a leadership program. And simply the education program is where we're traveling to high schools and we're educating students on the science behind climate change. And we do run into skeptics or, or people that are unsure about climate change and, and how the science relates. So um, our, our presentation is backed by references um, from the IPCC, from NASA, from NOAA. So if a student or a teacher would like those references, we openly share them with them. We also have a climatologist on staff. And if I can't answer the question, I'll be genuinely honest with a student or a teacher, but definitely speak to our climatologist and I relay the, the message back. And then from the leadership side of things, uh, ACE has a leadership uh, action fellowship program in our different regions. So with the students I work with, one of the initial modules that we work on is talking about climate change, simply. And, and through this module, students are able to stand in my shoes, so to speak, and answer those frequently asked questions about the misconceptions of climate change. And I think that's a great way to really train students and feel confident in speaking about climate change. Know that, know that every time you speak to someone about climate education, you're not gonna be, they're not going to be as receptive. So you have to be able to have resilience and stand and speak with confidence. And speaking of resilience, I want to I want to give Gina a chance to. There's a really neat tool. I know the White House has been very much involved with it, and NOAA. There's a climate resilience toolkit that's out there on the web. I hope I uh, Frank Neopold's in the audience. That's a really excellent tool. I would ha I advise everyone that's listening or streaming this or sitting here watching to take a look at that. It's an amazing. I think we have a question over here uh, in the middle. Uh, but while we're getting to that, well, Gina, did you want to respond to any of that at all? Um, I would just say that, um, so miscon misconceptions, that's um, usually a product of political or cultural um, division. So um, really tackling that, um, what Amber was saying about actually educating students on this, the actual science behind it. Once you know the science, there is no getting around it. You cannot debate it there is no getting around it, um, that is the truth. And once people know the truth, um, they, they have no option other than to work toward a solution. So that is probably the most important thing, is and, getting and, the science. And yeah. Craig wanted to follow up on that. And I think the question here is in the third row, the third row here in the front. Um, go ahead, Craig. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, you know, to teachers, uh, I think, I think any time that you address critical thinking, you know, you are addressing um, uh, the need for people to be able to uh, recognize the science behind the, the climate. Um, you know, I think, well, I've certainly found that um, a lot of times the students that have questions, when I really peel the onion and get down to what it is, it's, it's oftentimes a lack of um, uh, nuance or sophistication about the processes of science. What does preponderance of evidence mean? Right. Uh, what does it mean uh, to, to uh, uh, 
to replicate and the importance of replication. And those process pieces that give us confidence to look at one pile of information versus another pile of information and have more confidence in one than the other, um, I find that as I work with my students around those things, they end up uh, doing their own uh, sorting. Yeah, quite often. And that's a great point because science literacy, climate literacy is important because I think there's a large part of our public that believes that science works like a court case, reasonable doubt, and it yeah. doesn't. The scientific method is important as ever. Uh, here we go, question. I can just come from Driftwood Middle School. We are a very old school, and we have the oldest chillers in the world, you know, our AC units. And we're constantly breaking down, but by raising awareness and every single thing that we can do in our own individual classrooms, um, just the laptop cards and stuff like that, a utilization of technology right now has increased, and that's one of our challenges right now. So just raising the awareness, when to pull, unplug, you know, at the end of the day, we make announcements. The kids go through the halls, make sure everything is unplugged. But just constantly raising, have the posters up, having tips up around campus, having it in the morning announcements, that's what we do. You know, and kids that might not see the poster are going to hear it on the announcements. Or, you know, it's just little things like that that we do. And we, we've got a, a challenge, too. So as we do the challenge, it's having the kids become more involved. And then they're more liable to take it home. Got a question out there? I'm wondering if uh, each of the panelists could comment on particular challenges they faced in uh, starting their programs and how they overcame them, as well as resources that were important or maybe that they don't have or didn't have at the time and wish they had had. Thank you. Who wants to tackle that one first? Mm -hmm. I can tackle <laughs> All right, so uh, one of the major challenges I faced when entering in the market uh, well, in the region of Georgia, working with ACE, is that in Georgia, a lot of times we don't like to talk, we don't like to call it climate change. We like to say climate education, climate science, environmentalism. So it took some time for me to get accustomed to be able to talk about climate change as it stands with the science in a classroom of educators or in a school. So that's one of the challenges that I've had to um, overcome. But that all comes with the, the education as well. Um, I would say in terms of resources, I, I'm almost certain that Georgia was not the first um, region for our organization. So uh, when we started in, in California, we started gathering resources and things that teachers in our initial work, in our initial um, network had already used when it came to climate changing, climate change, excuse me. So I think just continually, gradually um, increasing our resources through teachers, through storytelling, through students that we've worked with are what is making our organization very successful. I would say that cooperation is a big challenge um, I faced. Um, yeah, so there are students <laughs> that uh, are very involved in climate change. Uh, success and uh, helping to stop stop it. So um, there are also students that do not want to be involved. Um, so really getting them involved is a major, major issue um, that we, we I have faced in high school a lot. Uh, not as much in college. There are definitely issues in college and throughout society, no matter what age, uh, getting people to cooperate with, whether it be a recycling program or uh, going to a presentation about climate change, uh, turning their lights off, anything as simple as that. Uh, changing people's habits is a bit of a challenge. Um, in terms of resources, I'd say that uh, when you're working in a small, a small environmental club, just uh, in a little town, it's sometimes hard to get funding for certain projects. Uh, people that 
are uh, supportive of our efforts really really come through with that and they help a lot. Sometimes though, funding, funding is a bit of an issue. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so. Welcome to my world. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but uh, it can be worked through and there, there is a solution most of the time. So. We have a, oh, did you wanna? Uh, yeah, search? actually, uh, no one's mentioned partnerships. Um, that's huge for us in Broward County. Um, we've uh, partnered up with the Miami Heat, uh, one of our large initiatives, and they're totally sponsoring our How Low Can We Go Challenge. Uh, they, and that's an incentive for all the schools because they were national championships champions when we first started the initiative, the How Low Can We Go Challenge. We had 64 schools participate the first year, and we're up to 87 now and they supply all the banners, they get the tickets there, they get the kids, they, the winning school, they're bused to the stadium, mm -hmm. they get their own seats up in the, st in, you know, in the stands and they're on the floor. And this is an incentive not only for the students but for the teachers, you know, so they're more inclined to support it. And then facilities. I am on that phone all the time when my kids come back and they read the meters and it, for some reason it's gone up and um, like I said, we've got old chillers. So we're constantly in communication with facility to see what's going on because it's a, if it's a 24/7 that they have to let it run because sometimes from district they can shut them off. So it's constantly being communication mm -hmm. with facilities to make sure that you know we're on the same page. Yeah, I would say for, for educators, you know, go for it. Uh, there, you know, you know there will be hurdles and you go for it. Uh, I, for administrators, I have the good fortune to work in a district, in a school, uh, for an administrator, f with staff and colleagues that will help create space for things, help create space, some cover for us to try new things. Uh, and I think that's really important. I will reiterate partnerships. Most of what we have done, or good, well, good chunk of what we have done over the last 10 years wouldn't have been part, possible without the Will Steger Foundation, our central partner in this work, because you can't be everything, but you have people out there that are able to, to, uh, uh, to fold in and, and build partnerships that make you a lot stronger than you would be on your own. Question over here? Yes, I had a question for Amber. You'd mentioned that once you've gone through your climate education that you encourage the students to get engaged through their lens such as performing arts and other things. I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that. Sure. Sure thing. So the first component is the education component. Component We educate students through a multimedia assembly. And then after the assembly, we ask for students who are interested in furthering their engagement with our program or furthering their engagement with climate education to come forward. And from that, from that group of students, we really have, have dialogue, have conversations around what are your interests or, or what do you foresee your school looking like in terms of a sustainable place over the next year, over the next semester. And we work with those specific interests in, um, in a climate solution. So I can give you an example. I have a group of students that I've worked with at a performing arts school last year who are interested in, in strictly music and writing verses or, or writing songs or raps that engage people in climate education and the discussion through a song. So we took these students on behalf of ACE to a professional recording studio where they got to record a song called Planet Savers and they got to really emphasize climate education through that song and really get, share it out to a large network of people in and outside of our, our organization. So that's just one example. Any other questions? I thought we saw, I thought I saw one somewhere. There's one back here. Okay. I was curious to know from the whole panel, but particularly from, uh, for you, Linda, uh, sorry, Gina, um, are you familiar with what all the federal agencies are doing when it comes to climate education or just uh, climate in general? And if not, what could the federal agencies be doing more of to get the message out to particularly the um, K through 12 and college students, as well as the general public? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think that we have in, um, in schools, there are definitely a group of students in most schools that have an interest. And I think that reaching out to them first is the best way of going about to reaching out to all of the students in that school. So really, if you, uh, if you contact an environmental club or um, just any, any student group that's involved in environmental education and awareness, then they can help to disseminate that message throughout the student population. So I think that federal agencies really reaching out to 
uh, student leaders is a major, major uh, opportunity to disseminate the message, yeah. Definitely. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? I can speak from just working in schools. Typically, uh, we try to identify the assistant principal over instruction and then go down from there, the department chairperson over science. And those are, for us, we've found the most key people to get our programming into the schools. Yes, my name is Stephen Williams. I'm the principal at Driftwood Middle School, and we're a health and wellness magnet. So I'm pretty familiar with Linda and her accomplishments. And I know she's very modest, and she minimizes the things that she does. But as a result of her efforts, you know, Driftwood Middle School was nationally recognized as a Green Ribbon School, and she was also instrumental in um, ensuring that the district was nationally um, recognized as a Green Ribbon District. So I really wanted her to talk about the importance of broadening this um, beyond just her green team, the impact that it has school-wide and district-wide, and how it has impacted all of Broward County being with the sixth largest school district um, in the nation. And, and before you answer that, actually I wanted to amplify that some because that's the question that I had. Many of these efforts can be at the local to regional level, but how do we in some cases broaden or amplify these efforts so that they can have a greater impact and a larger footprint, but per perhaps pick up on that. Well, after we won the Green Ribbon Award, um, I reached out to several different schools in the county that I knew that already had strong programs, but they just needed to add a little bit more pieces because on the U.S. Department of Education Green Ribbon Schools, there's three pillars. It's sustainability, health and wellness, and environmental literacy. And I saw that some of the schools, by, using, uh, by looking at the P3 challenge, which is our district um, STEM uh, contest or award recognition um, program, we were, I was in communication with the STEM program and Lisa's here today, and we just were looking at the schools that were strong in certain pieces that all we needed to do was support them in maybe the health and wellness piece, or maybe we needed to support them in the sustainability piece, and we would just make recommendations, and it just kept expanding, and like I said, we went from Driftwood Middle School to the district, and it's just, you know, they're already doing it. They just didn't realize they were doing it, and it's just bringing attention to what they're already doing and maybe amplifying it a little bit more. And we have a question back there. And if you're listening or streaming out there, continue to tweet at hashtag WHChamps and hashtag Action Climate. My name is Bill Golden. I represent uh, the National Institute for Coastal and Harbor Institute. Uh, and I am, uh, I want to paraphrase the poet, that the child is the parent of the parent. And as I go across the country, I find a lot of parents that no longer believe in facts. They can't be persuaded by facts. They believe in belief, and they believe those beliefs should be their beliefs. But they love their children, and they listen to their children. I don't want to get you in trouble with your school boards or anyone else, <laughs> but it is so important that these children have serious conversations with their parents. They do believe in this intergenerational equity. They are aware of it. They are the ones that begin to get it very quickly. Uh, my generation and other generations below me don't get it. How do you motivate the children to have that conversation with their parents without, as educators, getting in trouble with your school board? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I often say we have to move climate change out of the notion of, of being a belief system. I often get the question, do you believe in climate change or do you believe in global warming? My son believes in a tooth fairy. So we have to move beyond that discourse and dialogue. So what do we think about that question? Um, I'm glad you brought that up. So thank you, Bill. At ACE, we're working on a new initiative called Have the Talk. Have the Talk. Um, it doesn't matter who you are, what generation you're from, start the conversation. And how we go about starting that conversation is with an open-ended question. What do you know about climate change? What do you know about the environment? What are climate solutions that you have heard of? Not having the question be so narrow that it's either a yes or no answer or that the, the person listening may perceive it in a different light. So just trying to, try to learn from another person and what they initially know about climate change. That's one thing that we're working on. Any other thoughts on that? I think that's a very key point that you're raising here. Well, I would just say that uh, in my experience, like I said earlier, a lot of it is uh, giving the students the, the skills and, and, and critical thought and the background in terms of the science so that, that they know. I mean, I, I don't know about the, the longitude and I don't know if we have time to wait, but I do know that, uh, that uh, students have 
those conversations and, th and that they have their strong in that truth for us, right? That idea of insistence on truth. And uh, uh, for kids that uh, don't have the filters of their parents, um, I take some consolation in the fact that every student that I work with pretty much you know, knows how to work with their parents. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and, and, and sort of, uh, um, and, and the parents love their, their children. And so I think some of those conversations happen just because even though um, they may not understand, uh, they certainly want to understand because it's, it's their child. Uh, my, own, my own example, my father certainly didn't uh, understand what I was doing in this environmental business, um, <laughs> but he definitely <laughs> supported me because he loved me and, and I was his son. So I think that probably happens, maybe not in, in as overt or programmatic way as, as we might want to see or as quickly as we want to see, but I think it happens. Yeah. Over here. Hello, my name is Troy Newman. I'm one of the ACE ambassadors for the Washington DC district. And um, in high school, of course, it's a really smaller scale, so it's a little bit easier to get the high school students involved. But now that I went on college, it's my second semester. I guess this is for Gina. And to piggyback on the last question, how do we fix that generation gap? Like for me to go to my president of the school and say, you know, hey, how can we reduce our energy usage? And we'll like, they kind of like brush off the issue. And I want to know like what tactics could I really use to kind of like bring that awareness to my school? Um, Linda, do you have any thoughts on that? Because I would imagine, I did you want, towards uh, Gina. Uh, yeah. oh Gina, do you have yeah. some, sorry. Yeah, that's, that's so great that um, your second semester, <laughs> I, I feel that so much, that's so great. Um, yeah, so at UVM there is a lot of student activism. Um, there are so many students that who, that they, uh, they really are invested in this campaign um, and this cause. So I would say that going to your president, is that's a great thing. Um, I think it's important for um, faculty who work at your college to see that there are a lot of students supporting your campaigns and your causes. Um, I think that showing Showing the number of students is really important. Uh, for example, we would have uh, different rallies around a uh, certain cause, whether it be divestment or reduction of energy usage. Um, we would have that quite often on campus. And I think that maybe organizing a rally like that would be really, really helpful um, in helping you accomplish that. I think that would definitely get the president's attention, um, and that would be really helpful. Yeah. And the reason I was asking Gina to weigh in on this too, because I can oftentimes if you make the business case for what you're doing, that often gets people's attention too. So I wondered if you showed any sort of financial or business case for some of the things that you've been doing and some of your efforts in terms of it actually helping the bottom line for the school, perhaps. I don't know. Well, we've had um, Naturescape support us in a lot of different um, in the Butterfly Garden and financial backing and um, other programs with we had uh, community events. When we have community events, we have a lot of partnerships come in, and that's another way of educating our parents because they're coming out and supporting the kids and being in the conversation. And you know, we, we get a lot of backing for a lot of different things. Right. Um, there was something else that just can't think of what it was. But you were talking about something. I'll think about it later and I'll talk to you about it later. We have another student question. Okay. Hi, I'm Priya. I'm also an ACE um, ambassador from, I'm a high school senior, and um, I guess, I guess I just want to know what really motivated you, each of you, um, to become champions of this cause? Um, what drives you in your communities? What motivates you? Um, and how can you filter that energy to those around you? Want to start there? Great. Well, I think that um, what, what motivates me personally is, I mean, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, w I went to a uh, presentation by a University of Minnesota professor 20 years ago, and here's a bullseye on Minnesota and central Alaska, these two places that I had come to love, uh, predicting some of the greatest temperature variations uh, uh, over seasons um, of any place in the country. And I, and I thought, could this be true? I mean, is this right? And uh, it really launched my own personal journey towards that. Um, and as far as, uh, as a professional, um, it's sort of this perfect problem to bring to students. 
for them to wrestle with. Not just the urgency and importance and, and uh, absolute critical nature of the issue itself, but also as, a, as an educational path for students to wrestle with something that really is transferable to all kinds of, uh, all kinds of other uh, settings and, and, and topics. Right. Anybody else have any thoughts? Yeah, I did. Um, what really moved me as I was watching the Al Gore Inconvenient Truth documentary uh, in 2008, and there was a piece on there where the polar bear was swimming and he couldn't make it. And I just started sobbing and I was like, this is just wrong. This shouldn't be happening, you know? And really, literally three months later is when I started my green team. I can either sit there on the sidelines and complain about it or I can do something in a small way that's now growing into a big thing. You know, this community thing and maybe even the tri-county, how low can we go? My thing is all about reducing CO2 emissions, period. I mean, if we can start doing that in small ways, that'll grow large. That's what moves me. You know, I love this earth. I love Mother Nature. I love the ocean. I love the mountains. I live on the ocean. You know, I live on the ocean. And I, you know, it's going to be, we want it to be here for our children. So. Yeah, anyone else want to, your, your motivating stories? Yeah. Um, when I was a sophomore in high school, I had the opportunity to go to a youth summit. Um, it was called the Adirondack Youth Climate Summit. So it was focused on the Adirondack Park, which is where I grew up, um, where an area that I really loved. And so I had the opportunity to hear climate scientists speak on the issue. And it was really the first time that I was exposed to actual climate science. Um, and it, it, something, something in me changed. I can't really explain it. After I heard uh, Jerry Jenkins is a great climate scientist who works in the Adirondack Park. And he, um, he gave a presentation, and it completely changed the way I looked at everything. Um, I remember leaving the room and looking at my friend, and I was like, we have to do something. Like, this is craziness. We have to get solar panels. We have to do all this stuff. Um, so after that, uh, I just, me and my friends, we all plunged into uh, different projects and uh, we were so motivated after that. So I was really lucky to have that experience in high school, definitely. And do you have some thoughts, Amber? Sure. Uh, what really motivates me is just youth in general. Like, I pride myself on wanting to be a catalyst for positive growth in the lives of young people. And sharing my story a little bit, in high school, I wasn't in the environmental club. I didn't work with climate change initiatives or didn't know much about climate education at all. But now that I have the opportunity to work through young people and do what drives me, helping them help their environment, that's what motivates me. Getting the opportunity to do something that I didn't get to do in high school, but I can now do with others. Yeah, and I, I think that those are very compelling stories. And I'll, I'll put a bow on it by saying as much as we love polar bears and monarch butterflies, I've got two kids at home. And that's what motivates me. Uh, our GDP, our economy, our national security are also at stake here as well and so I want to thank you all for what you're doing for this country for your communities and thank the White House and this administration for this uh, uh, activity today and that's going to close out our first panel so let's give our, 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 our awardees a hand <laughs>